I'd just like to add to um, the comments of my colleagues who've thanked the organisers. Um, we've had a marvellous time here. I'm hoping to explore more of India and have an equally marvellous time over the next couple of weeks. But really the hospitality and the friendship that's been shown to us has been fantastic and it's fantastic to be here and be part of this conference. So I have come over from Leicester in the UK. Um, many of you may know where Leicester is, but you, you can't get much more into the centre of England. These are the places I work. My time is split, split between the hospital in Leicester, um, in the top right corner, and the University uh, Department of Health Sciences in the bottom. Leicester's also famous for some old bones which were found underneath one of the uh, parking areas. Um, these bones turned out to be the bones of King Richard III. And if you ever come to Leicester, you should go and see his resting place in the cathedral. What may be less familiar is that Leicester also boasts the biggest and no doubt the brightest Diwali celebrations in the United Kingdom. But back to topic. So I'm pleased to be able to talk about uh, late and moderately preterm birth here. I'm going to cover something about the concepts of gestational age, um, address why these babies, or at least I believe these babies are important and more and more people are coming to the same conclusion, and think about what we actually know about them. But importantly, what should we do with this information? So many people have said that these babies have been forgotten. This uh, graph here um, shows what happens if you put in a relatively quick and dirty search to uh, PubMed using the terms very preterm or extremely preterm. And this represents the number of papers from the years 1980 on the left to, to, to the end of last year um, that uh, are returned to you if you put that into your search. In contrast, if you put in moderately preterm or late preterm, or as they used to be known, near-term babies, you get this much smaller, but nevertheless increasing number of studies. So the interest has been relatively small in this group of babies until quite recently, but over the next 10 years, uh, the last 10 years, there's been a definite increase, and I'm sure that that increase will continue. So previously, we've regarded gestational age as a simple dichotomy. You were born either preterm, before 37 weeks, or at term, above 37 weeks. Much more though, and I think you'll appreciate this from your reading, we are beginning to regard um, gestational age much more as a continuum, going right from the smallest babies born at 23 weeks of gestation up until the most mature. What this has led to is this rather complex looking categorization of gestational age. And this is based on the fact that we're learning more and more about the outcomes of babies born at these different gestational ages and within these different groups. The babies I'm going to talk about this afternoon are those that are born moderately preterm between 32 and 33 weeks of gestation and late preterm between 34 and 36 and you'll see those highlighted in red. I think we should also have our eye on the ball for the next group up, the early term group, but I'm not going to address that today. So why has there been so little interest in these babies until relatively recently? Well, I think it's because most of them are well at birth. Most of them don't come to a neonatal unit, most of them don't darken the door, and therefore there's been little input from paediatricians and neonatologists in their care. They're often discharged from hospital early after birth, and unless they have major problems, these babies are not followed up. And what that means is that we have little, if any, routine data for these babies. And also, as you saw in my first couple of slides, we have very sparse research data in these babies. And so, until recent years, the influence of prematurity in this group has really not been known and hasn't been acknowledged. So why are these babies important? 
Well, this is some, some data from Hannah Blenko in, in uh, London, um, who's looked at the distribution of, of preterm births. And you'll see that the lighter area in each of these columns um, represents those babies born um, moderately to late preterm. And the lighter areas um, are by far the biggest across the globe. But if you look at the far right of my slide, there you have Southern Asia. And so not only are these babies important in terms of the proportion, but you have huge, huge numbers of preterm babies of which these are the vast bulk. So particularly important here, I think. And I think what started to raise the red flags was the initial data that came out about this group of babies, which was mortality data. And if you look here, these are a number of studies that are published, and a few of them are, are quite old now, but the data nevertheless remains relevant. Looking at mortality, mortality in the first week of life, mortality in the first month, and infant mortality. And what you can see from these studies is that there appears to be between a two and sevenfold increase in um, mortality for babies born at late preterm gestation. Much of the data that I, produce, uh, that I show you today will be late preterm because the 32 to 33 week group are even less well studied. What you'll all, doubt, all um, no doubt have noticed as well is that there is one quite recent study from India here which shows, I think, the difference in mortality rates um, that you have here compared with um, the USA and Canada. What I think is most alarming about this is the Swedish study, which also suggests that there is um, increased adult mortality, albeit um, a small increase. So what about the early outcomes for these babies? This is some data from um, our own study in the East Midlands of um, England, um, which was a prospective population-based uh, cohort study recruiting um, 1,200 uh, preterm babies born at 32 to 36 weeks gestation, and a similar number of uh, babies born at more than uh, at, at or beyond 37 weeks of gestation. This is data just for the singletons. I am going to show you data from my own study because I have access to this. But actually, if you look at most of the observational studies that have been conducted in this group, the results are remarkably similar. So what you can see here is that. These babies were more likely to need resuscitation at birth, to be admitted to a neonatal unit, to need respiratory support, and to need fluid and nutrition support than their term-born counterparts. If we look closely, more closely at respiratory morbidity, that increases there for all sorts, all, all kinds of respiratory outcomes, from transient tachypnea to respiratory distress syndrome to pneumothorax, and for, unsurprisingly, I think, the need for uh, non-invasive and invasive respiratory support. In our own study, we, showed, we had similar findings. A greater proportion of babies um, were intubated at birth and were admitted to the neonatal unit. These are highly significant differences between the groups. And a greater proportion required respiratory support at all levels. But interestingly, Although the proportion of babies needing respiratory support is much greater, if you actually look at the amount of respiratory support they need, represented by the number of days, you'll see, you can see that the, uh, by far the, the greater um, support is needed by the much smaller babies. And as far as severity of illness is concerned, if this can be used as a proxy, the 32 to 36 week group are not that different from the term babies. So what about other common morbidities? We're all very, very familiar with the problems that these babies often have of hypoglycemia, hypothermia, and jaundice. We've looked at the more severe end of the spectrum, looking at hypoglycemia of less than two millimoles per litre, hypothermia of below 36 degrees centigrade, and jaundice that actually requires treatment. And you can see from this graph that the, in comparison, in comparison with the purple columns of the term babies, both the moderate and late preterm babies um, have significantly more of all these outcomes. <laughs> 
When we turn our attention to breastfeeding in this group, and this again is from the LAM study, the later moderately preterm birth study, um, breastfeeding is poor in these babies. It's poor across the board, but particularly so in these babies, despite the fact that they're in hospital for longer, at least twice as long, sometimes more, and therefore we should be able to support them with that. Growth has also been shown to be worse. In a United States um, study, even after exclusion of small for gestational age babies, there was still an association with being underweight at one year of age. Interestingly, this association was no longer present at 18 months. You've had a prospective cohort study here in India, reported quite recently, only this year, which enrolled only healthy late preterm infants, so those that didn't need any support in the neonatal period, and found a similar finding, but actually magnified. So what we really want to know is how these babies do in the long term. And I'm afraid here as well, the news isn't good. Studies have shown that these babies are at greater risk of cerebral palsy, developmental delay, problems with intelligence, poor visuospatial reasoning, and attention uh, problems. Our own study, uh, the two-year outcomes were reported by parent <coughs> excuse me, questionnaire and showed that although neurosensory impairment is relatively uh, small um, component in these babies, there's still a significant um, neurodevelopmental disability burden, which is almost exclusively accounted for by cognitive impairment. <clears throat> Again, from the LAM study, these babies um, have been shown to have, thank you, um, to have uh, greater risk of showing autistic features. I hasten to add this isn't a diagnosis of autism, but a trend towards autistic features. More likely to have socio-emotional delay, and there is the neurodevelopmental impairment. When we look at health outcomes, this is um, another UK study, the Millennium Cohort, a much larger study, which asked parents to report their children's uh, health at five years of age. What this shows is um, long-standing illness, which actually limits the child's activities, so a child not able to do what a five-year-old child ought to be able to do, or the parents think he ought to be able to do, or she ought to be able to do. And you can see again that there is actually a gradient of risk, um, the reference group being children born at 39 to 41 weeks, and a clear increase um, in uh, limiting illness at five years of age. When you drill down, that seems to be a large component of that is asthma and wheezing illness. And you see a similar pattern. And this seems to be supported by the fact that these, these children at five years of age are much more likely to be prescribed asthma medication. In terms of longer term respiratory morbidity, the even longitudinal study um, from the southwest of the UK um, looked at children born at 33 to 36 weeks gestation and performed spirometry and showed that at eight to nine years, all of the measures that they looked at were reduced in those babies born at, 34 to, at 33 to 34 weeks. And worryingly, that the decrements that they saw were similar to those seen in children born at 25 to 32 weeks, which I think is quite sobering. Some, but not all, of these differences are resolved by adolescence. You may well be familiar with this graph, which is Scottish data looking at the relationship between gestational age and special educational needs. And I think this is very convincing um, in its uh, illustration that these babies are at greater risk than their term-born counterparts, though at lesser risk, of course, than those more immature babies. So I think we have to conclude, based on this data, that compared with the term-born counterparts, more mature preterm infants do have increased mortality, poorer neonatal and long-term outcomes, and associated with this comes higher costs of neonatal and paediatric care. Of course, the extremely preterm infants have much bigger problems, but they're only relatively small numbers. And as I showed in my first few slides, the moderate to late preterm born infants have smaller problems, 
but my goodness, they're big numbers of babies. The effects are likely due to be, to be um, multifactorial. Any of these um, factors, I think, may be important, and I think, as yet, we're not sure which. So what should we do with this information? Well, our aims of care in this group of babies, I think, should be op to optimise antenatal care and to avoid any unnecessarily late pre and unnecessary late preterm births. This has been a problem, and I think it's being reduced, particularly in the United States. We need to educate people. And this has kept coming up today, hasn't it, with everything we've talked about. We need to avoid over medicalization of these babies, and I think that a previous speaker has touched on this. We need to safely support these babies, nevertheless, and their parents in interacting and developing together. We need to be preemptive in our support to avoid the common problems that I've talked about. And we need to recognize quite quickly, promptly, when babies do need further medical support. We want to support their development and survey them appropriately in the longer term, though that is a really crucial and difficult problem. And we want to provide cost-effective care. I just want to mention quickly antenatal steroids, because this has already been alluded to before, but I think it's of particular relevance to you. Trials in the United States have shown benefit in late preterm babies, but these have been in high-level hospitals and high-income settings. Conversely, the antenatal corticosteroids trial, which was a, an implementation um, uh, to try and increase the use of antenatal steroids in six low to middle income countries, showed an increased rate of neonatal mortality in larger infants and increased risk of maternal infection with the use of corticosteroids. I'm delighted to see that the antenatal corticosteroids for improving outcomes in preterm newborns or who World, World um, Health Organization Action Project um, is either in progress or about to start. And that this is going to look separately at those born before 34 weeks, but also at late preterm infants. So we should have a, an answer to that from that study. So what evidence do we have to guide care? Well, we've heard a lot this afternoon about observational studies, and by far the weight of evidence here is observational. There are many, many now retrospective studies and analyses of large data sets in this group. There's a small number of prospective observational studies, of which our own in the UK is only one, but it is a small number. And as uh, Ravi Patel mentioned, um, and John Zupanchik, there are virtually no, if any, randomized controlled trials in moderately to late preterm babies. And yes, I hope you agree that we clearly have identified a previously unrecognized problem. We're now exploring the extent of that problem with observational work, but we don't yet know the underlying cause, and so that work should continue. But we really have very little evidence to actually guide practice. And we do need trials, and we do need education in this group. For now, I think we should be concentrating on excellence in early care. We need to identify the maternal and infant risk factors that might affect a baby's stability in the early neonatal period, and institute appropriate monitoring early if we can do so. We want to keep mum and baby together. We want to educate and involve families in the baby's care. We need to reduce the risks of these very basic problems that these babies have, of getting cold, of not establishing feeding, of becoming hypoglycemic, jaundiced, and of becoming sepsis, which clearly I've learned a lot about today is a great problem in your country. I firmly believe that supporting and encouraging breastfeeding and kangaroo care in these babies will go a long way to helping these problems. We still have a lot to learn, though. We don't know what the risk factors are for moderate to late preterm birth. What we really don't know is how much of these outcomes relate to immaturity per, per se, how much is due to the indications for delivery. So does what happens in pregnancy, maybe even before pregnancy in the mum, does that influence the outcomes?
We need to know how to manage these complicated pregnancies closer to term, and we need to know the effects of socioeconomic factors. We need to think about improving aspects of neonatal management and what those aspects might be. I would suggest perhaps respiratory care could be looked at in trials and that some of the common morbidities. Follow-up, I've already alluded to, is going to be very difficult because of the numbers of these babies. And I think what we ultimately need to move to is looking at targeting care to the highest risk groups. But I think there's a fair bit of work to do before we're actually in a position to do that. Thank you for listening, and that's all I have to say, apart from acknowledging my co-workers. In one of the slides, you've shown that 41 weeks is the ideal time, because less than 41 weeks, there is a trend for having a problem, and more than 41. So are the guidelines going to change on the timing of delivery? Because now should we take as 41 as the best one? I, th I think the, the range which is now regarded as uh, the best time to deliver, if you like, is 39 to 41 weeks. And certainly there's a lot of upcoming work which is looking at gestational age as, as I suggested, a continuum and is showing that the gradient of risk uh, does go right up to 39 to 41 weeks. What we have to remember though is that the obstetricians are balancing the risk of small risk of adverse outcomes at 37 to 38 weeks maybe and 34 to 36 weeks with the risk of a neutro death. That's a, a difficult call. So I think we have to focus on reducing the, the truly unnecessary um, births beyond, uh, before 39 weeks. And those probably are the ones that are down to mother's choice. And I think there's a lot of work, particularly in the States, going on to do that. And I think it's, it's showing some success. Is the morbidity related, uh, seen in the long term, related to morbidity at the neonatal period? Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing, I think. Is the microphone on? Yeah. Uh, the morbidity seen in long term, was it related to the morbidity seen in the neonatal period? That means that babies who got more neonatal morbidity had more chances of long term morbidity? Okay. Um, that, that's something that we're, we're not certain about. The, some studies have looked at um, the, the babies that needed neonatal intensive care and looked at their longer term outcomes um, and shown that it does seem to be the babies that are sicker in the neonatal period. However, there are other studies that haven't shown that effect. So I, I think the jury's out on that. I don't think there's been enough work so far. Um, but certainly it would be nice to know and that would be part of the work we'd need to do to think about targeting interventions for these babies. Thank you very much, Elaine.